So that being said, welcome everyone. Today we'll be talking about some automation tools specifically for use with Creo. Uh, we are elite and we are happy to present today, but we're actually going to be joined by an uh, expert in the field I'll introduce in just a moment. Let me just tell you a little bit about elite. We are a manufacturing company as well as an engineering services company. You can see we've got a couple different divisions. So in our factory, we are using various tools, uh, software tools to do our engineering and our manufacturing. And our engineering services group is a partner with PTC, which has various products that you can see below. Uh, today we'll be talking about Creo and some of the automation tools for that. And for that, we are partnered with a company called Simplified Logic, and Dave Bigelow is going to be joining us today, giving the presentation. You can see some of their tools listed below, Nitro Bomb, Nitro Cell, and Nitro Program. Uh, we've given some presentations on these in the past. We will, I'm sure, show them again since they're very powerful and we love uh, making these tools available to people. So very quick intro. I'll, I'll let Dave introduce himself a little bit more. Um, and just quickly for reference, our contact information. So myself, Stuart Weiler, the director of PLM at Elite, and for David Bigelow at Simplified Logic. If you have any questions, please feel free to reach out to us. We're here to help you, and hopefully you find today's session interesting. So Dave, whenever you are ready. Okay, uh, let's see here, just make sure we've got everything rocking and rolling. Um, see the screen okay? Looks good. Okay, so today we're gonna talk a little bit about uh, uh, an interesting subject. Number one, it's just uh, dealing with Excel and, and Creo for sure. But in order to kind of really understand the power of that combination, I was talking with Stuart, and we just wanted to kind of get a, a good basic introduction to Excel tables and Power Query. These are some areas of Excel that people may have heard about, but not used before. So I thought we'd do a, a quick training session on how to use those and how to set them up uh, just to kind of get your head around how Excel works a little bit. Then we'll show at the end, uh, dealing with bills and materials in Creo and um, how um, one of our products, Nitrobomb, can take advantage of all this cool technology we're gonna be talking about here and really streamline the process and make it easy to do. So the first thing I wanna start off by, by saying is that uh, there's a huge disclaimer with this. Um, there are many ways to use Excel and uh, you may know some better tips, tricks, or approaches to doing things. We're just gonna cover some of the basic concepts and examples today. And uh, hopefully you learned something or, or kind of um, pick up on something you didn't know. I do realize there's many, many ways to do things. And uh, I think uh, this is just gonna kind of cover the basics of how to get there. So one of the key things about Excel that we've, we, um, fundamentally have to realize is that there are a lot of features and benefits and they typically start off with just cell data. Like how do you enter information into, into Excel? And this is what most people just kind of use Excel for. I'm creating a spreadsheet. I'm going to put some data into it. And then they typically will use formulas to kind of reference cell data uh, to do things with it. Like for example, to add numbers or concatenate data or summarize information in some way. Um, another area of Excel that is is um, getting more use over time is something called the name range, which is basically just a, uh, a simplified reference to Excel data, like cell data, um, cell addresses are now uh, basically described as names to or variables to that information, which is helpful. Um, some newer areas that Excel has come out with over the last 10 years or so is uh, something called the table. A table is basically just a, uh, uh, it's like a named range on steroids. Um, it it's it, I view it as kind of like going from a portable phone, which is kind of like a named range, to uh, kind of like the first iPhone. It has all these capabilities, but it's very modular and it keeps things very well structured. But it still kind of does the basic stuff, um, takes advantage of the basic information that's already there. Then when you really scale up to the uh, the real benefits of Excel, um, especially these days, this has been something that's been around since 2010 with Excel 2010, is something called a query. Now, it originally started as a uh, kind of an add-on to Excel, but um, since I think uh, 2016 of Excel, it's become kind of baked in. And uh, it's been around for quite a while. It's a very, very, very powerful capability. 
Um, but unfortunately, it's a bit buried in Excel and not many people know it exists or even how to use it. So most Excel users still to this day uh, live in this kind of cell data and formula world. Um, a few of them will go into the named ranges, uh, named ranges uh, zone of Excel or kind of use that capability. But less than 1% of Excel users still to this day tap into tables and queries. And uh, this is a, a pretty big problem because it really does reduce the workloads and efforts required to kind of get some amazing results out of Excel very short period of time. So <clears throat> when you're talking about like the Excel data, you know, the typical Excel user um, using cell data and formulas to kind of get around and do things, the problem is is that most of that effort is very manual, very detailed, uh, often very cryptic because uh, they may not set up name ranges and they're just doing cell references. And the bigger the worksheet gets or the workbook gets with more worksheets and so on and so forth, it just becomes very cryptic and hard to kind of navigate. Where's information coming from? Uh, why is it there? Why is it being used in this formula or that formula? And as a result, it tends to be pretty delicate, uh, especially the larger a project gets. Um, and the more cryptic and delicate it becomes, the harder it is to share that, that document with others to be able to take advantage of the efforts you put into kind of putting Excel together. On the other hand, a query is kind of like an, the latest iPhone or, you know, latest uh, um, Samsung phone or whatever. It, it pretty much opens everything with your face. It's that easy of an experience compared to kind of the old way of doing things. So to kind of give you, um, I was thinking about this and I was like, okay, well, what is the, what's the core issue of uh, Excel and, and, and how, how do we have to kind of always remember to think about things? Well, there's really kind of four quadrant quadrants to this process. And if you really think about it, typically Excel is a data forward process fundamentally, meaning we're taking cell values, we're writing a formula and we're translating them into other information or we're putting them in other cells for other purposes or uses. Named ranges are kind of just to make that a little bit easier, less cryptic to kind of look at, and you can still use the same formulas and process to kind of get to those same results. Tables are kind of the next layer above that or the next level above that in information handling. And you can still use formulas within tables or use formulas external to a table to kind of refer to it to produce outputs. And tables can also feed other tables too. So um, they are very powerful. And when you start doing things with tables, the, the formulation of things and the reference of things gets a lot easier uh, versus using cell uh, values and formulas and range, uh, and even named ranges. And I'll, I'll show a couple of examples of how to do this. The other nice thing about Excel in this data forward process, and this is something that's very important to remember, is that you know in Excel, whenever you're using Excel, you're not really ever modifying the source data. It's always, I put data in, and then I'm trying to transform it or use it in another way or refer to it to get to some other result. So um, what Power Query does is it's kind of this data transformation process. It's this upper level of this of these uh, of this four quadrants here. And, and how it works is basically you establish a connection to uh, the information that you want to reference, and it typically expects a table. So. You can use uh, cell values, but it's, it's it's really hard to incorporate cell values and named ranges into Power Query. It's much easier to use tables um, as a reference, uh, but it that doesn't mean it can't be done. It's just it's just easier to do with tables, and that's kind of where they gravitate towards uh, with the product. So a connection basically establishes just a, a reference to that data, and then you build your query around that. And in that query, you can actually start to merge data, append data, transform it or apply formulas to it above and beyond, you know, the levels of what a user would normally see. And then the output of that is a table. That's what it, that's what it expects to drop to. So uh, a, a, a query and a power query process is kind of, a, it's still in Excel, but it's kind of um, not, as, not as obvious that it's occurring, but the results will be obvious because they always come back to a table. The other neat thing about queries is that you can not, not just use uh, connections or create connections to tables within the Excel document, but you can also create connections to other data sources. So for example, if you needed to connect to an ERP system or an MRP system, 
or bring in a text file or a CSV file or uh, some other data source like that. You could do that quite easily um, or even data from other workbooks. You can create connections to other sources quite easily, bring those in and augment them and manipulate them with the data that you're manually entering or copying, pasting or, or deriving in some way with your Excel workbook to produce the final results you're looking for. The cool part about this uh, with the Power Query stuff is that queries can actually reference other queries, either as duplicates or copies or, or um, uh, other connections. So you can actually recycle information. So instead of loading data more than once, you can actually load it once and then make a copy of that internally um, uh, within the Power Query uh, realm and reference it uh, so that if any data changes, you can actually, um, let's say you wanted to summarize data in one, uh, one way in one particular query, but, but organize data or modify it in another query, you can still use the same source data to do that. So it's very, very, very powerful capability. Uh, but again, it's not very obvious, and we're going to try to expose some of that and make it, make it more transparent today. Um, the overall uh, benefit you know, of these features is uh, pretty profound. So once you start kind of getting into tables and you start getting into queries, uh, your life literally changes. It, you just don't ever think of Excel the same way again, especially when you're dealing with large amounts of data or even simple data that just comes like uh, simple stuff that comes out of Creo and you want to um, uh, manipulate it or summarize it or, or organize it in some way. Um, you're gonna start gravitating toward tables uh, all the time uh, for simple things as well as the complex. There is a special mention here within Excel. They do have this capability called arrays. Uh, arrays have been around a long time. If you've ever seen them or uh, had to use them, they're, they're really, really tricky. Um, you, they're really kind of a mental exercise as to what's going on uh, and how you apply them, when to apply them, how to create them, and how formulas use them. Uh, so um, it's kind of an expert only thing, and I don't even think they're needed, especially with power queries. So if you if you're com if you're comfortable with arrays um i suggest get uncomfortable with them they're just not worth it in the long run and they and most people who receive a workbook that has those in there it's too easy to modify a formula or something and, and screw it up royally so arrays are special in excel uh and our general direction and recommendation is to avoid them if you can um, because power query and tables just kind of make things so much easier so as an example, we're kind of going to walk through today. Uh, this is just pure Excel stuff right now. I'm not even going to talk about Creo at this point. We're going to talk about Creo later and how, how we make it much easier um, using this technology with our tools. But let's just kind of focus on the basics of how do I do things in Excel. And um, this particular example that we're looking at here is we're going to come back to this. But in a typical bomb cost estimation, um, doesn't matter if it's Creo or whether it's just, you know, Excel data or CSV data that you're working with and trying to summarize in some way from an ERP system or whatever. You typically have a data uh, goes to a table, then we're going to, you know, we can use that table for getting some summary metrics if we want to, or you can do other things like merge it with other data sources to kind of compute, transform that into the final results. For example, uh, summarizing the cost or co component counts or whatever the case may be. So um, that previous slide that I showed had a lot of different paths to kind of get there. When it comes down to bomb cost estimation, this is really kind of the, uh, the, the key components that we're gonna be looking at. So just as a quick refresher, um, named ranges in Excel uh, are pretty simple to do. Um, and I wanna kind of use this as a baseline just to kind of show you the difference between how to do things with named ranges versus how they're done with tables and then ultimately queries. So when you look at name, when you look at creating name ranges, if you haven't done it before, this is basically how it's done. It's actually a formula operation, um, and there's a name manager, and you can also define names uh, manually. So if you just entered text into a particular cell or range uh, and selected it, you could actually go up and say define a name to that reference. And you'll notice here in the in the dialog below that it's referring to a specific sheet and address, and you're giving it a kind of a generic name or a variable for what that's going to be. You could also do that directly with an Excel uh, up in the um, uh, upper left-hand corner of the worksheet. You could just manually type in the name uh, to that. It's the same way to get there. And if you ever select on a cell and it has a named range, it'll display there. Uh, so the, the weird thing about named ranges um, is that you can actually, 
have multiple named ranges to the same reference, which is kind of a cool thing, but there are some limitations to them, which we'll talk about in a second. Uh, another another way to do it is to just go directly into the name manager. Uh, so you basically select a cell or you say that's the target cell I'm interested in, go to the name manager, and then you can go define a brand new name and then select the actual location uh, that it refers to. That's another way, just another path to get there. Um, once you have them created, the big benefit is that you have something that can be globally referenced throughout the workbook. So if I... Um, I have a named range called my intro that I've created. And if I go to another sheet and I start to write uh, a formula, you know, so you start off with an equals, and you start to type in the name of that variable, it'll show up automatically in the dropdown. And then you could just kind of select that and then have the value kind of result. Now that result that is there is actually a formula to that particular named range variable. So you could see there all the way on the right that we have um, hello world basically being referenced to the named range that is pointing to the original source data. And if we change the data on sheet one, it'll, it'll just automatically update no matter where that variable is used throughout the entire workbook, whether it be in a formula or whether it be a specific uh, value uh, reference like we're doing here. The biggest benefits and problems for named ranges um, is basically this. Uh, they are the, the the benefits are their their workbook global references, which is which is fantastic, right? Because you can go anywhere in the workbook, you can just recall that information, reference it, and continue to use it um, within formulas or just as a a value reference that you want to place in in an Excel cell, and and that's that's fantastic. The cool thing about them also is that you can rename them, you can move them around manually if you drag a cell and move it, it it'll move that reference with it. Uh, they can be redefined with these if you want to change the name or or the region that it that it occupies. It's it's pretty pretty easy to do that. Um, the problems with them is that they are they're not case sensitive. And what I mean by that is that uh, as you see there, our variable is my intro, my capital I intro. Um, if you change if you uh, if you try to create another my intro that starts with capital M. It has all lowercase values or all capitals. Excel won't care. It's basically just going to take that named range uh, as um, uh, it's going to assume it's the same thing and def and revert to the to the very first version of that, I believe. Uh, and they are also typically static. Um, now, static is a debatable thing because if you have a uh, a value that is changing uh, by a formula or is updating. The, well, yeah, the content is is dynamic at that point to the named range, but the named range is fundamentally a static reference. Um, you can make them dynamic. Uh, there are some arguments for that by using you know combinations of other features of Excel. For example, tables are, are good at that, but fundamentally they're just kind of a static reference for the most part. And as you can see here in this in this graphic, um, you know the difference between using uh, the typical uh, sheet cell reference address reference uh, for writing formulas. Uh, it looks really cryptic and, de and delicate uh, versus using a named range, which is just a much better way to kind of refer to information that you're going to be using or computing. So I'm going to show you real quick a uh, a painful example of of how. Uh, let me share a different screen. Okay, so um, I assume you can see uh, the cell sheet that we have here, and you'll notice that uh, I have three sets of examples I'm going to show. So this particular example is a bill of materials that we're trying to summarize uh, for the unique components and also the unique items within it and get some metadata about that. Okay, so we've got some data that's been added here. And unfortunately, we had to add in some kind of helper columns to kind of detect what's going on. Uh, if we do the show formulas on this, uh, you'll notice that our data is, this is our core data right here, but we have all this extra stuff kind of going around that's pointing to each of these, uh, uh, each of these named ranges uh, that are set up. So you can see here that this particular cell is referring to end body. Well, end body is this kind of blue part. Um, this one is also referring to kind of the counts of those items, unique counts of those items. Uh, and this one is referring to trying to determine 
uh, whether or not the item, uh, we're trying to get a unique list of items. So is, this is basically to compare a self comparison to that data. Uh, and the formulas are, are kind of nasty. So, um, and they're kind of all over the place. So if, so if, I, were if I were to receive this uh, from somebody I worked with, I'd probably scream uh, just because it's complicated. And yeah, there's a pattern to it, but I still have to go through and evaluate every change that I'm going to make to this to try to understand what the impact is. To give you an idea of kind of how much of a mess this is, I'm going to trace the dependence on you know some of these cell values. So every one of these cell values, as you see, is actually kind of pointing um, to different areas of the sheets, uh, and it's easy to kind of see. You know, yeah, I can kind of trace what the flow of the information is, but it is still uh, a lot to look at. So if uh, if I if I um, highlight any of these things, you can see. I've just got relationships going all over the place. And this is one of the real pains of, of dealing with named ranges is that are very beneficial um, uh, in, in trying to, uh, you know, define the references for things, uh, but they do not, you know, but there is, they are also delicate. So if I come in and I say, uh, I've got a, a test new item here, um, notice my item counts and quantities, which are 40 in this case, uh, are just, kind of staying there the same, no matter what I add in, it's just, it's not, I have to go and update this range uh, to include those items, or I have to go insert uh, data within here. So if I come in and insert uh, data within here, say uh, test, uh, whoops, test item here, we get 41, test item, probably, Thinking off a lot of things, so we got to copy a formula down. Yeah, so you see, I've got to go make a lot of like changes just to make sure things are kind of correct in the end. Um, so they're they're very kind of structured and static, with the exception of I've got to go unless I know what I'm doing to go insert information or modify it so that all the rest of my formulas work. So they tend to be a little bit painful. Um, point here. So um, let me switch back over to here. So uh, let's talk about tables. So tables in Excel are actually pretty cool. So they're also very easy to set up. So if you actually have uh, just a, a, you know, cells entered in a, in a worksheet like we've shown here, uh, all you have to do is just kind of highlight the region that you're interested in go up to the insert function and hit table. And then it's going to say, okay, you want to create a table. Great. Now it's strongly recommended that you always put titles <laughs> or a header on each of these columns that you're working with, because it's just going to be much easier to deal with down the road because tables will infer a column name if you don't give it one. And when you're defining a table, um, you can optionally say, I don't want table headers, but then it'll just assume uh, some headers for you and kind of infer new column names on the fly anyway. So it's just better to create them with headers to get it home with. Uh, so when you when you do that, uh, that's going to create a, a new reference. Um, let me switch over here. Another way to do this is to just select the same data. And then if you're on a more current version of Excel, you've got a quick format uh, kind of icon that shows up in the lower left corner. If you just select tables and say select table, it will actually create a table from that data also. But once you've done this probably two or three times, you get frustrated with the menu picks and you start using the shortcut. And the shortcut is control T. So basically you just highlight the data, hit control T, and it's gonna come up with that create, same exact create table dialogue that you would see uh, via any other method. And when you say, okay, create it, it's going to enable a new interface for you uh, called table tools. And um, it's going to kind of default show you this. And you'll also notice that the format of the information that you had highlighted will change. So it's actually going to switch from kind of the, the plain Jane view that you had it to uh, kind of their default uh, table style um, for presenting that same information. The dead giveaway that it's a table right off the bat is typically the filter buttons show up at the top of those columns. And this interface pops up when you, uh, or becomes available when you click in it. Um, and another very, very important thing is that, and I wish Microsoft would do this, when you create a table, 
I wish it would give you the ability to just give it the name right off the bat, uh, but they don't. So they kind of assume that uh, the name of the table, which is basically a, um, a glorified named range uh, in Excel, is is uh, going to default to kind of a table and then some numeric index that it keeps adding. So the, the first thing you should always do when you're dealing with tables is to change the name of the thing so that it is at least something you can understand and reference later. So if you had, for example, a bill of materials and you also had cost data in separate tables that you created on different sheets, it would, knowing which one was table one versus table seven that it happened to create is kind of a pain. So always name your, <laughs> your tables. Uh, after you create them and you could do it at any time. You can even change the name at any time, but it's very important to just make sure you get the named range uh, or excuse me, the, the table name set up so that it's addressable by Excel. Now, when you, when you, when you do that, like, for example, we called this table that is being displayed bomb data. Um, that's the, the name of the table we gave it. Uh, you can use it like you would a named range at that point. However, there are some additional benefits. So if you type in equals bomb data and then hard bracket, uh, bomb data will show up in kind of a little pick list of functions. And then when you hit the hard bracket, it'll expose this, this other set of references about that table that you can use. This is called the structured reference. Structured references are very, very powerful um, in Excel. They really make things easy to understand and use. And you could do things with them like this. So if I wanted to, let's say, get the, the count of the items that were in that column manually using an Excel formula, you could just say, I'm gonna use my standard Excel formula for count A, um, and then I'm gonna put bomb data and then hard bracket and component. Now that component is actually the column name of the table that is there. Uh, and it could be whatever the column name is that you want. And the, the beauty about tables is that once you set up these structured references, you can actually change the column orders in the table. So if I want a description to be first component to be second, the formulas won't break. Um, so they, they it know it's smart enough to know even if the data shifts or gets reorganized uh, in a columnar way, it'll still maintain those references. So that structured reference formula that you see there um, actually will, in this particular case, produce a result of 15. So um, another beauty about Excel tables is that they will, by default, auto expand on the rows and columns to the right. Now, if this doesn't work for you um, it, when you're experimenting with Excel, that's a dead giveaway that that the option is not enabled or has been accidentally turned off. And it is very easy to turn off uh, through the Excel context menus if you're not careful. So, um, if if it if it's not auto expanding when you add content just below the table. Uh, then it's an option setting with an Excel, it just needs to be changed. But in this particular case, I wanna point out two things. Number one, we're adding some new content to the bottom and the end of the table always has kind of this little carrot uh, in the lower right corner. Uh, and that's actually a drag handle. So if, if, if it doesn't auto expand, you can actually just drag that little handle and drag it down or up uh, to take care of things. And um, you can also right click in the table and do th operations like delete rows or uh, insert rows, things like that also. So um, if we added a bunch of content, uh, the nice thing about this is that the uh, the table will automatically expand to the end of your content um, and then your formulas, your structured references, like you saw up there, uh, just like magic will just kind of encapsulate that change. So in that particular case, the item count is looking at the col component column of this table and it just updates automatically. Um, Another kind of nifty thing you could do is, uh, let's say we wanted to add a, a new column to the right. Well, you could just literally type in text and it'll just automatically add it. If you don't want that new column to the right, you could just control Z and it'll just leave the value there. But in this case, we're just accepting it. Um, and the other nifty thing is you can actually write formulas inside the table to refer to other tables or to the table that's currently there. So in this particular case, um, we're using this um, structured reference, which uh, uses a prefix for the, um, uh, the current row of the particular column. So in this case, the current row of component for, based on the cell position that we're currently editing. And when we add that in, um, it will give us the length of that particular field that's there. And then you have the ability to either populate that down manually uh, by double clicking on, there's usually a little highlight uh, in the lower right corner or you can uh, have Excel automatically expand it with a little context helper. 
Um, and the beauty of this is that once you've kind of done that, once you've, once you've included that formula down the column of the table, any changes to the column, or excuse me, any changes to the data, or if you add data to it, those formulas will automatically populate down and update based on the current row that that formula is being applied to. Um, and again, we're just using a structured reference. So if we, if we drag the entire table around or slide it, or if we change the column orders, say we wanted length to be in the first uh, column instead of the third, um, these things will just automatically update as the grid. It's a very dynamic process and works great. Um, talking about these special references a little bit more, um, there are, just to kind of explain them, that ampersand is really kind of an indication for the current row. So if I put a formula outside of the table, a few columns over in Excel and refer to the table and put the ampersand in for the component at that particular column, it's basically like just doing a cell reference, you know, like you would normally do, except it's, it's, it's sensitive to the table at that point. So it is easy to do. Um, column, those column tags that are there basically are just saying the entire columns of data, uh, the entire table, table is obviously with a hash all uh, a hash data would just give you the data region of the table hash headers would just give you the headers so if you're looking for the index of a particular column you could do that just by referencing the header and then also the the other slick thing is is um, the totals row so within Excel you have this totals row uh, but you have to you have to enable it you just can't refer to it if it doesn't exist uh, even though they present it if it's not displayed which is kind of weird but um, the totals row can be enabled by going back up to the table design and saying, show me the totals row. Now, the neat thing about the totals row is that it's not just the total of the last column, which is basically the default that it tries to assume if it's numeric, but it also, um, each of these columns has, or each of these total rows for each column has this little context menu that can kind of pop, uh, pop up if you, if you click in it. It's like a little validation uh, cell that has additional aggregate functions. So if you wanted to get the count of things or the count of number of occurrences of max or min values or sum, you could actually go determine what are the particular values. This particular case, it's sum by default. And um, that's just extremely helpful. I mean, it's just nice to have that information at your fingertips and you could set it there versus writing in a formula, but you could still refer to it also. So. In these two examples that you see off to the right here, uh, we have one that is uh, referring to the table. It's looking at the totals uh, 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 reference and the length column. And that's enough to get the 128 to that particular cell if you were to do it. If you wanted to use a normal Excel formula to, to basically get the, the sum of the length column, you could do that also. Um, but the, the structured reference uh, is probably more stable. Um, uh, versus uh, the one below, uh, because if the if the if the data changes in some weird way, uh, the structured reference is 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 typically a, a a a better result because you can allow the table to kind of auto compute the the summaries in the end. So let's take a look at uh, what tables look like um, in our Excel example here. Switch over to. So taking a look at tables, um, one of the things I want to show right off the bat here is I'm going to switch the formulas on this. Now I've used formulas within this to kind of replicate what we were doing in the named ranges and that, that works. Okay. Um, if we show kind of our, our, our precedents and our descendants for here, you can kind of see it's still doing the basic, the same basic formulation. Uh, and, but it's, it's, it's fundamentally cleaner. Um, so. The, the results are a little bit cleaner. We're using uh, aggregate functions to kind of summarize the data, but it's at least easier to look at. And you could see that we're not doing, you know, cell-based references, um, you know, within a range and all that kind of stuff. It, it's just a, a little bit cleaner, but still these are complicated. These are still too complicated in my view for what we want to do, because this is pretty basic stuff. We're just trying to get a summary of the data that's here. So let's go take a look at how to do this with Power Query. Switch back over. So within Power Query, um, 
these are really, really powerful. And again, like I said, once you kind of get your head around it and you figure out how to how to work with it, you, you're just not going to want to go back. They're just so much easier. So we're going to go kind of walk through this bomb cost cost estimation example, but we're going to do it in a in a little bit uh, slicker way. So Power Query fundamentally requires uh, tables as kind of inputs. And what I'm showing here is that we've kind of pre-selected a range. We've said, I'm going to go up to the data tab, which is how you access Power Query. And it's under the get and transform data section. It's not really called Power Query, but this is kind of how they refer to it. And if you go and you say, I want to get from a table or range, it's going to force you to create a table anyway, which is going to result in this Power Query editor. And you'll notice that the query name is the default name default name for the table it created, which is in this case, table five, which can be rather confusing. So this is why we recommend go create the table first, then go name the table and then read in the table into Power Query, you know, from table range. And then your your table name makes more sense as to what it is. And you could, of course, change this. Um, if we go another step further here, just kind of talking about like what Power Query is and how it works. Uh, this is an interface that's built into Excel. Um, it's a capability that's already there. We just kind of showed how to get to it. And this is like all this new functionality that opens up in a separate window. So you can do really cool stuff. Uh, like, for example, you can go modify column data and transform it. Uh, you can basically what Power Query does is it, rec it records steps of how you want to transform your data and load it and merge it. And those steps uh, will will accumulate uh, as you move forward. And then you have all these options at the top uh, for adding data, transforming the data, like if you wanted to transpose it or modify it in some way or perform math operations on it or do your own custom functions with it. You can, you can do all this and it's all at the query level versus the Excel level. So um, there's a lot of stuff that you would normally wanna do that's just like right here. And it's just a question of what are the steps I wanna do to transform it. So I'll give you an example. So this table of bill of materials stuff, um, when we read it into Power Query, we're gonna basically define the steps that we want to occur to transform the data into the result that's currently being shown in Power Query. And that's the data, that's gonna be the result of this transform. So you can see we took just two columns of information and then we transformed it, cleaned it up and, and grouped it and summarized it, basically kind of getting all the, uh, the summaries of the items that are in here into a new table view. Um, but we got to get this back to Excel somehow. So the way you do that is there's really two options. Um, if you just do a, a say a close and load, meaning close Power Query and load the data, the default is it's going to kind of annoyingly create a new worksheet, not a new workbook, but a new worksheet in your current workbook and load that data there. Once that's there, um, you know, okay, great, it's there, but that may not be the only purpose I'm going to use for that. If, if all you're interested in is just getting that report of information, great, do that. Just accept the defaults and, and rock on. However, most of the time, especially when you're working with multiple tables of data or multiple sources of data, you really don't want to just load data to the worksheet every time, especially if you have a large data set. You just kind of want to create a connection to it. And that connection uh, will still be in Excel. It's just not gonna display and render all the data and, and worry about it as much. It, it's gonna keep things a lot faster if you do it this way. So when you do that, you get this queries and connection, uh, uh, or so let's say you did this load of data and you're like, okay, I've created my connection and everything like that. How do I find it again? Well, to find it, you basically go up to the data tab. There's a button there called queries and connections. And if you click that, it's gonna expand out this little side tab that shows this is uh, a query that's been defined we can see that it's a connection only to some data. And if we double click on it, we can then get back to, you know, go through what's the source of it, what is the transform doing, you know, what's being loaded, what's being transformed, what's being formatted, uh, and all that stuff. But we don't see that result on the workbook. We just see connection is there. Load that data in, you can actually right click on the, the query, it, assuming you created a connection, Right click on that query and say load to, and then you can identify where you want it to go. So if you want to go to a pivot table, or you want to go to a pivot chart, or if you want it to um, load it to an Excel spreadsheet uh, on an existing sheet that already has a table like this one, or its own sheet on a different one, you could do that. 
Um, but when you do this, it will actually load that data in and it will create a new table with a new table name for that too. And it's typically the query name by default, but you can change that. So just in these few steps, we've been able to take uh, the data that's there, load it, transform it, and come up with a brand new report without writing a single Excel formula to get to this point. Now, the beauty about tables, as we talked about before, is if you add new items, you know, uh, it's going to automatically extend the table and so on and so forth. And then, but you'll notice that that query to the other side of there hasn't done anything with that yet. The reason for it is you have to refresh the data, or refresh the connect, or refresh the um, the data that's been processed. So you can do that by either right clicking on the table itself and saying refresh just this table, or the easy thing, which most people do, is just go up to data and hit refresh all. And when that's finished, you get your new item and your new counts. And again, we didn't have to write a single formula for any of this stuff. So not one formula required to basically take that reference information would that is being updated or can, or can change, run it through those processes in Power Query and just write the results back to Excel. All that was just, I mean, it doesn't take very long to do and, and when it's finished, it's finished. It's just a setup workflow and it will just transform data every time according to whatever the data is that's there. So that's pretty cool, but what else can we do with this, <laughs> this piece of magic? Um, so I wanna show you real quick that even though we have a, 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 a query connection set up for this bomb data that's in here, what if we wanted to compare that to the item costs uh, that are coming from a different file on a different system? Well, I have a, um, it's, it's actually pretty easy to do. You just go up to the data tab and say, get data. And you got all these options. So this can come from another workbook, come from a CSV file, come from different formats of text files like XML or JSON, or you can connect it to a database directly. So if you have access to your MRP database where there's a standard report being written, or if you have a network drive where a CSV file is being written out every 24 hours for what your item costs and fast start purchases are, um, you can actually just kind of connect Excel to that. And if you have a network mount or if you're on a network and you have open connections to the databases, you can then share this, this Excel, this work you're doing, you can share this Excel workbook with anybody in the company. And if they open it and they have the credentials to get to the same information, they, they can just open the Excel book, hit refresh all, and it'll just do whatever computing they need to do. It's pretty amazing when it comes to this. So in this case, we've said, we're gonna go get file from, uh, get data from a file. It's gonna be a CSV file in this case. And when we select that, it's gonna say, okay, what do you wanna do with this data? Do you wanna transform it, like clean it up or modify it in any way for use? Or do you just wanna load it? Um, in this particular case, we're gonna just load uh, as a connection uh, which we talked about earlier. So when we load this connection, you'll see that in my queries and connections, I have a query that's connected to my, my bomb, uh, data that's there, but I also have another connection to that external file that doesn't show up anywhere in the Excel workbook, but it's there. Okay. So, um, the beauty about this is that you can then take those two connections and play with them. Uh, so in this case, we're going to merge the data. So to do that, you just simply go up to the data, get data, combine queries. And in this case, we're gonna merge the data to say, I want, I want the data from my bomb table and the data from my cost table, even though they have different columns, they have different data, I'm gonna select the two columns that are important. And each of those rows that is in there, I wanna match only those values and then merge that data together. And when you do this, it will actually bring up Power Query and show you your, your source data plus the data you're joining to, and, and it's indicating, well, there's a table of information there uh, that has been merged. What do you want to get about it? You can just say, well, I can expand that out and say, really, I don't want to repeat the item name because it's already merged on that. And the component and the item name are the same according to this criteria. I just want to include the unit cost. And when you include the unit cost, boom, we've got ourselves a brand new uh, column that is actually the result of the two queries coming together. Now, uh, typically we rename this column to something that's, um, you know, we don't need it to be item cost dot unit cost. That's, that's useful, but it's not necessarily um, what we want to see in a final report. So we've rename that, which I've done in the previous, you know, in between these steps. And now we're just going to add in a new column to kind of give us, well, okay, what's the extended cost of these, each item that's in there based on quantity and that bill of materials. 
So adding a custom column is literally just adding a custom column. It gives you the name of columns that are there and it's just a simple equation. You could just double click on the on the uh, available columns in that interface and add them in, multiply them, subtract them, divide them, do whatever funky math you want in there. You can even put if statements into this type of thing if you want to. The syntax is a little bit different than normal Excel, but it's it's approachable and it'll tell you whether the formulas are good uh, at the bottom before you commit them. The result of that would be to automatically have a new column here called extended cost, which we've just created. And then we're changing the name of this uh, query to be cost summary so that we have something that's more descriptive about what this query is generating as a result. When we finally load that data back into Excel, you could see that we have our two queries above, we have our cost summary below, and as a result, we've just done a little bit of formatting on the columns within the result table to put like dollars, you know, format for currency, things like that. But this is, this didn't really require any effort to get there. And we got everything we needed uh, for here's my list of components and then boom, here's our cost summary of, of what those are based on the item costs. And we didn't even have to view the item cost data at all. It's completely going to uh, dynamically update every time you load and refresh this data. So if your item costs are changing every day and uh, there's a file out there that you can reference uh, every time you load this bill of materials up, boom, you just hit the refresh button. It'll show you what the current you know cost of that is based on the the data in another system if you need to. Um, so understanding the relationships between queries is is actually pretty easy. Um, basically what you do is you, if, if you see a bunch of queries in your query pane, you know, like uh, like over here above this um wow, if you see a bunch of queries over there and you're not really sure how they relate, you can just open up Power Query and go to the view query dependencies and it will show you a nice little graphic that says, okay, current workbook has got this, this external files feeding this particular item, and the two of them are coming together to get that, so that uh, get that cost summary, and then you know uh, from there on it's it's just you know navigating and, and using things. So let's talk about uh, um, Power Query and how it's kind of used within uh, within Excel. I'll just give you a quick example, then I want to show you something else. We're running a little bit short on time. Let's go to share this. Okay, so now Power Query, um, in this particular example, uh, this is the same data that we started with. And I'm just gonna quickly walk you through what the transformation is to get to this. This is another query that I wrote with Power Query also that is computing the items that I don't have cost for. So I've got, these are the items that I have cost for, and these are the items that are in this list that I don't have cost for. So if I added in a new, uh, let's say test, part and came up to my data and said refresh all boom i see that i don't have an item in my cost data called test part at all uh, and it's just very easy to do that uh, so you can see here we've got uh, our first query here takes the uh, the source data and cleans it up uh, this is our item cost reference to an external file and then we have our sum costs that are here and then we have another query that is doing the difference between the item costs and the bomb to try to find out what isn't in there uh, and reporting that as a separate query. So to give you a bit of a live example, um, let me get rid of this row here because I don't want it to distract us too much. So if I come in and I want to create a brand new uh, query, I'm just going to do it from table range and I'm going to give it um, uh, a different name. Let's call this live. So this is the this is basically just a pointing a, a reference to that original source and it's showing me a preview of what's here. Now if I came in and I said, well, okay, let's just uh, let's uh, I want to transform this data to kind of group it by, um, say, uh, let's make this quantity is going to be our new column. And it's going to be a count of rows. Now all that's that's fantastic. Uh, but if we sort this, you'll notice that I've got some duplicate rows here for the same items. And if we look a little bit deep, deeper, we could see, well, there's some of these have spaces in them. Some of them have different name, uh, some of them are capitals and not, and it's kind of screwing up things. So uh, what we could do is we can actually come back and clean that up. So the first thing I'm gonna do is I'm gonna select both columns and say, let's just transform this all to uppercase. Uh, that'll clean up any uh, letter differences and so on and so forth. 
The next thing I want to do is I'm going to come in here and replace values. So the first thing I want to do is I'm just going to take all the spaces out. And the next thing I want to do is let's um, let's also do let's say a, a, a find and replace. Let's say if it has BLT, we really want that to be bolt. And that'll fix some of those issues. And uh, oh, let's also let's let's transform this data again, or let's maybe put back in. If it has a comma, I really want a comma and a space to kind of be there. And then let's just kind of make it more human readable. So let's capitalize each word. So just that quickly, we've been able to make these changes to this data. And again, this is the transformation. These are the steps that are going to execute every time this runs. So if we summarize this again and say, well, okay, let's let's try to group by now. This is going to be quantity. You'll notice that our our list is a little bit shorter, which it should be. And uh, we've now got clean data, a more accurate representation of what's going on here uh, for the total on the on the components and everything. Um, once we have this here, if we just say close, it's going to load it to Excel, uh, the worksheet as as we described before. So that's the kind of the default behavior. You can only have one table uh, per worksheet that is referenced off of this stuff. Uh, if we want it just as a quick example, um, let's say that I wanted to create a merge of the data. Let's do our own little cost uh, cost analysis. So I'm going to take that query table that I've created, and let's take it in with our item cost data. And it's literally just a matter of selecting the columns and determining what amount of data we want between them. Once we have this, it's going to open up Power Query. We're going to expand this out. Get our unit cost, and then we can also just add in a custom column. Say I want quantity times. In this particular case is I'm I'm leaving the original name that's there. You can also rename this afterwards. And um, say this is our new total. And in this particular case, I'm going to do a close and load two. Now I could do a connection. But in this case, I'm going to pop this right here, just so we can kind of see the data that we're producing. And we can add the total rows in. It looks like we've got one more item in here than expected. So it's probably a data cleanup issue, I've, a step I forgot to pursue or, or apply. But you, you get the, you get the, oh, no, sorry, we didn't, uh, yeah, no, that's correct. So. We've got uh, we've got all the data in here uh, that is from here, but it's being summarized. You see the totals the same. There just might be a uh, an oh BLT. Okay, so let's go fix that real quick. So you see BLT is a is a value that I needed to kind of replace. So let's actually go let's go and do trans. Let's do a find replace values. Yeah, we're going to insert a step. Uh, BLT is also bolt. Whoops. Down to the bottom here. I think that might be better. Close this. Now watch this. When we close this, uh, this table uh, should update. Should update. Okay, so now we've got everything kind of cleaned up. Um, we've got our items uh, corrected and everything. Formatting this stuff is really just a matter of kind of selecting these two columns, and you can just use your standard Excel formatting. And if you don't like the style of the table, you can actually come back to the design and say, well, I'd really like it to be presented this way instead. So um, pretty cool stuff. Uh, we could, uh, Stuart, are you still there? I am, sorry, I was just on mute. Okay, um, you wanna take uh, uh, an extra just quick five or 10 minutes to talk about uh, bill of materials exports with Creo real quick? Yeah, I think so. Go for it. All right, so let's talk about, uh, let's talk about Creo bills of materials for a second. So I'm gonna switch over to my screen. Sorry. Screen. And so um, if you've ever done bills of materials with Creo, um, it's it's a it's a bit of a challenge, uh, and it, and there are a couple a couple of reasons why. Um, 
but as I think we've seen here that if you can get the data into Excel, Power Query is like the most powerful tool ever for cleaning up some of the stuff and, and, and making use of it. However, getting the data out in a format that is acceptable is not always the easiest thing to do. Um, there are a couple of options within Creo for exporting those materials, but they're a little bit tricky. And you've got to be conscious about what they do as, as or you know, what those options are and how they work. Um, so if we take a look at, you know, one of the first go to's that everybody runs to is the bomb exports. Now you, by default, I think it goes to the browser, the inside browser or the internal browser within Creo and gives you kind of a, a breakdown in HTML. And um, we've tried to save that off and look at it. It's, it's pretty painful, but you can say write to a text file. And if you write to a text file, it gives you basically the same report that you would get in a web browser. However, you can use these kind of bomb format files, which are a little bit cryptic. Uh, they've been around for a long time. Uh, they do require a bit of testing to kind of get kind of where you want. But once you use a, a, a BFT file, you can actually kind of get the bill of materials to kind of kick out. However, there are two levels of breakdown that are occurring there. You got a summary bomb uh, option and you also have a breakdown option. And there's problems with each of them. Uh, the summary bomb tends to exclude content that you may want. And the breakdown sometimes includes too much information that you don't need. So that's just one factor. And you could actually take this into Power Query and, and read it as a text file and start to kind of work with it if you want to, but it's, it's not gonna be the most pleasant journey. Um, Another option is also, well, what if you want a little bit of structure to come out of this? Like, what are the levels at for each of these items and so on and so forth? Well, you can get that from the model information on an assembly, but that file that gets generated can, includes a lot of extra information that you don't really need. So that's a parsing issue and a cleanup issue there. Again, it's possible, but it's in Power Query can probably help with that too. Uh, but it's a bit of an effort to kind of get there. Um, the third most popular option is to just kind of uh, this go into the assumption that the bill of materials is actually on the drawing and PTC does have this nice cap capability for doing a, a save as CSV from a table. Uh, the downside of this, and it works really well. I mean, of all the methods we've shown so far with regards to exporting bills of material, it's pretty clean. Um, the problem is, is that if you have pagination issues with your tables, like if you have a table that wraps or, or goes to another, you know, uh, paginated to another table on the same page or across multiple pages, each export, uh, it only exports at the selected table, at least in the testing we've done. They might've changed it since we did this test with Creo 4, but fundamentally that's 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 a bit of a, a struggle too. So the way that we do things with NitroBomb is actually everything that you've learned today or that we've talked about today with tables and, and Power Query is kind of built into the latest versions of NitroBomb. So, when we do an export of the bill of materials from Creo, we're actually writing it to Excel tables by default. And then we're also creating those Excel Power Query connections for you so that you can easily fold in enterprise data or comparison data from other sources. Uh, let's say you had a previous version of the bill of materials you're trying to compare with or another design you're trying to compare with. Um, that information is already in the right format within Excel uh, through NitroBomb to be able to get to those results very quickly. The beauty about that is that anytime you update your, or, or do a next export, those calculations are gonna be automatically uh, updated for you. Um, and then of course with NitroBomb, you can also do you know, the imports also. So I'm gonna give you just a quick example of, of how to, to do that. Uh, switch back over to right here. So I have, um, I have Creo uh, open and uh, the same little example we were kind of, kind of playing with. And I'm just gonna take all of the defaults that I have here, and it's going to uh, take a, an Excel file that's empty and, and populate it with um, the data that's currently in the Creo session. So uh, it's gonna fire up Excel. You can see it's an empty file, and it's starting to write all this data out. Now it writes out in several different formats, and we're not gonna cover everything today. We've got a whole nother series of videos online for that, but every one of these, as you can see, has come out in an Excel table format. You can actually change the formatting on these if you don't like it, or, and, and, and NitroBomb will remember those uh, for the next export for each of these reports. So we've got all this data already kind of summarized uh, and accurately calculated. And if you go up to the data tab here, you'll notice that, oh, there's my queries connections to each of those things that are already there. So if we wanted to, let's just say for giggles, 
just to show how quick this is. Uh, let's go add in um, that data that we have for items costs, and we'll actually have this derive the cost of this on the fly, and then maybe demonstrate a, uh, a change or two as we go along. So I'm going to load this as a query connection to that external file. And one of the things that you have to be aware of with uh, these tables is we do export them as, as, uh, as text data uh, for all these cells. So this is also where Power Query comes in pretty handy. So um, if we come to our total components reference that's here, The, um, so even though we have these uh, these connections that are kind of here, I was just trying to connect out to the internet to look for something. But uh, da -da -da -da, let's give it a second. this total components um, query that's here, uh, we can actually modify this. So you can see here that this is currently a text column. You may want to transform this to a whole number because it is going to be a whole number. And you can see that it's just uh, making that change. Now, the beauty of this is that once we've got this, um, we've got these two queries in here, I'm going to do a combined query between the total components Got all that stuff and our item costs. We're going to merge on these two columns and only grab the stuff that we have pricing for. And just that quickly, um, starting to get this table organized. Now, for our final table, you can actually come in and say, well, okay, this is our, I'm going to click the columns that I want to keep and ignore everything else. So now I'm starting to kind of format re my report a little bit. Say unit cost. Oops. Unit cost. And uh, let's add in our kind of custom column for computing the extended cost. Just hit the quantity. There's the unit cost. In. Total cost. And I'm just going to allow this to create a worksheet and generate that report for me. So it's going to create a new worksheet with this here. We'll enable our total row, and then we'll just select uh, these columns here. Do a little bit of formatting on them, just so that we have something nice. So just bump this up in size so it's easier to see. Oops, right, right. Okay, so now the question comes down to, well, okay, we've got this workflow set up. Um, for computing the cost, what happens if the design changes? So I'm just going to go in and add in a few components just randomly. Add in a couple of those. Come down and add in a couple of these. Maybe one other. So let's see what we have. So we have a, a couple of new plates, uh, a couple of other components. So with NitroBomb, all you have to do is come back and say, uh, just re-export the reports, please. And it will go and update each of those reports. And it will automatically do, because we have a setting for this, um, to, exp to automatically refresh the queries. So you might assign it, saw this, uh, do a little cycle. And if we come back to our result here, boom, we've got our assembly costs automatically being computed based on that external file, as well as the, um, Data, the latest data that's been exported uh, from Creo. Okay, with that, uh, any questions or any, uh, Stuart, do we have any questions that we need to address? Nothing in the chat session. If anyone has any questions, feel free to, to type them out or you could unmute yourself and go ahead and ask. I think that means either you did a great job of explaining or maybe people are feeling a little overwhelmed. Hopefully not overwhelmed. It's really not that hard. Um, I think that uh, Excel is, is very approachable. We try to make it 
easier to understand yeah. like how to what the process is but until you go through step by step to kind of do it a couple times uh, it's going to feel a little bit foreign but hopefully this video that we've done uh, encourages people to kind of step through pause you know mimic some of the steps and, and get the results on their own well thank you very much i think i think it shows a lot of the power of excel and you know i know often the more you know about Excel, the more you realize how little you know about Excel. So it's certainly enlightening. Definitely, yeah, we definitely hit the the uh, the not the upper upper echelons of its capabilities, but the, uh, uh, a step certainly above what most people use. And I think it's just an awesome automation tool, especially with uh, when combined with our tech, of course, too. So with that, I'll, I'll turn this back to you uh, for closure, and then we could just kind of go from there. Well, thank you very much, Dave. Uh, yeah, at this point, mostly just wanted to say thank you for the, the presentation. Uh, I think it's easy to see how this could be really powerful. You can tie Excel to Creo, and it's it's kind of the sky's the limit at that point. So certainly some of the automation tools you guys have are, are very powerful. Thank you. Thanks for having the opportunity to come together and present this today. Well, if anyone does have any further questions, please feel free to reach out to us. We're we're here to help and happy to do so. All right. Thanks a lot, Stuart. Thanks, Dave. Take care, everyone.